Well, everybody, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas, because that's what we're going to be talking about for the next three or four weeks. Uh, let's look at the word Christmas itself as we begin. This may not be completely obvious to everybody, but Christmas is simply the connection of Christ's mass. Mass is as in the church service in the Catholic Church. So that's where the word comes from. The very first mention of a nativity feast appears in the Philokalian calendar, that's Roman. It's a document from 354 CE, and it recognizes December 25th as the day of Jesus' birth. Now, during the 4th through the 6th century CE, the Common Era, the newly legitimized religion of Christianity borrowed freely from pagan rituals and festivals all across the Roman Empire, and it was partially an attempt to unify the pagan masses with the Christian faith. Now, for most of Christian history, however, really until the 19th century, Easter was really the main Christian holiday celebrated not so much Christmas. These illustrations from Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol conjure up our ideas of what Christmas should be about, the changing of our Scrooge-like selfishness and miserliness for most of the year into a spirit of generosity and joy, where we gather with friends and family, exchange gifts, perhaps drink a lot of spiced wine and eggnog, while also sharing a delicious feast. But Charles Dickens did a remarkable bit of alchemy in his book. He really did change what was quite a debaucherous holiday up until that time into the Christmas holiday that we celebrate now. He toned down the more uh, raucous elements of the holiday as it had been celebrated for 1500 years and made them more palatable. Many of the festivities referred to in his book, and which we have such sentimental notions about, were largely based on pagan festivals. Paganism generally refers to any religion outside of the three major Abrahamic faiths, though it tends to focus on the religions of the ancient classical world of Europe and the Middle East. Now, let me point this out. Modern pagans do not take any offense at that term, pagan. <laughs> They've adopted it happily and usually refer to themselves as neo-pagans, because they've tended to not only adopt what they perceive as a positive faith, but they also minimized or uh, took away some of the more uh, raucous elements, which we're going to look at in a little bit. And it is true that some neo-pagans have adopted what we might consider excessive behavior that was common in the celebrations of this holiday in the past such as heavy drinking, even orgies, but still they're confined to ceremonial practices only. Now the use of trees, candles, yule logs, and even the exchange of gifts are all traditions of us that have nothing to do with Jesus or his birth, but they do have deep origins in the occult and paganism. Now I've got news for you. Jesus was not born on December 25th. That date is traditionally the winter's solstice and symbolizes death due to the sun being visible for the least amount of time on this day. The beginning of winter, which is commonly associated with death, and the end of life, spring, was kept in ancient times to ensure the proper times to plant crops and track the seasons. Because all of our ancient ancestors were keenly aware of the celestial terrain, this date has been significant across many, many cultures. In ancient Sumer, which is modern day Iraq, this day was representative of the birth of Baal, the sun god. And the Egyptians considered it the birthday of Horus or Osiris or both, and later the god Ra, who is the god of the sun. But perhaps the greatest influence is from the Romans' use of this date to represent the holiday of Saturnalia, which was a farmer's festival that lasted for about a week or so, sometimes up to 12 days, in which law and order, listen to this, it was a festival in which law and order was suspended 
and chaos was celebrated, usually around the 17th of December through the 25th, sometimes into January. It marked the end of the autumn planning season in honor of Saturn. Satus, the Latin word satus means sowing. So it was in honor of Saturn. The courts were closed, and the Roman law decreed that no one would or could be punished for infractions of the law, even destruction of property or the injuring of individuals during the celebration. Well, as you can imagine, things often got out of hand. The wealthy were expected to be nice to the poor during this time by either presenting small gifts or giving a free month of rent if they were uh, real estate uh, folks or not requiring a slave if they had slaves to work during the festival. Well, you can imagine what the poor did if they felt the wealthy were not sufficiently generous during this week when the courts were closed and laws were suspended. Now, I did come across some research suggesting that at the onset of this festival, the Roman authorities would choose someone who would be considered an enemy of the Roman people, a scapegoat, in other words, or perhaps a real criminal. And one from each Roman community would put forth a victim that they would force to partake in any physical punishments that they indulge themselves with during the week. Once concluded on December 25th, the Roman authorities would authorize the death of this man or woman, believing they were destroying evil, a scapegoat who must die for the sins of the people. Now, some Roman emperors thought the festival was too wild, no surprise. <laughs> Even the notorious first century Emperor Nero, some of you know about Emperor Nero, he was not remembered as a good guy. He canceled the celebration of Saturnalia for a time. Now, you can imagine the, the uh, influence of the wealthy on the emperor because uh, often the wealthy were victims <laughs> during this period. By the fifth century CE, the holiday had lost pretty much all of its religious aspects and was just a wild carnival similar to Mardi Gras. Actually, it was Mardi Gras on steroids. I mean, it was debauchery everywhere. <laughs> Sort of like Christmas has been trending. <laughs> An ancient Greek author, poet, and historian, Lucian, whose dates are 120 to 180 CE, describes in his dialogue entitled Saturnalia the festival's practices during his life. Lucian has the god Kronos, or Saturn, sometimes called Saturn, say in his poem, Saturnalia, he says, during my week, this is Saturn talking, during my week, the Sirius is barred. No business allowed. Drinking and being drunk, noise and games of dice, appointing of kings and feasting of slaves, not feasting on slaves, feasting of slaves, singing naked. That's how caroling began, by the way. <laughs> singing naked, clapping, and occasional ducking of court faces in icy water. Such are the functions over which I preside. Lucian also mentions the consuming of human-shaped biscuits. This gets back to the human sacrifice part that was sort of uh, lightened up. And instead of real human beings, they became human-shaped biscuits. Now, does that ring a bell, human-shaped biscuits? How about gingerbread men? Now, why would the early Christians choose such a date to honor their Savior when it had such amoral associations? Well, Christianity, unlike most religions in the ancient world, actually, was an evangelistic religion. It wanted to recruit pagans. So when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? So it adopted holidays that the people were celebrating anyway. They tried to Christianize them. They weren't always successful. Now let's look at the origins of the Christmas tree. This is the Sumerian tree, again, from Iraq. There are many traditions associated with the Christmas tree, most of which are steeped in occult and mystery origins. Now, while some historians could see the tree symbol has a phallic nature, as any kind of festival which is about the rebirth of life, it also symbolized the resurrection of their god, Baal. Again, in ancient Samaria, Baal was the sun god. 
and ancient Babylon, which is ancient Iraq, influenced the cultures of the Middle East and Europe. In ancient Iraq, Sumeria, Queen Semiramis told her subjects that a full-grown evergreen tree spawned in the place of a dead stump, which symbolized Baal's resurrection or rebirth through a tree. Now, the Egyptians saw evergreens as a symbol of life over death and used green date palm leaves, which were brought into their dwellings during the winter solstice observance. So some symbolic tree has always been celebrated during the winter solstice, thousands of years before Jesus appeared. Now the Yule log, I don't know about you, the Yule log's never been a big tradition in my home, but it's actually quite common in England. And some homes in America do it as well. So in Britannia and the regions north of Greece, the Yule log was viewed as a magical amulet, which eventually became the tool of Father Christmas when Christianity took over the festival. Now this ancient Greek festival spread all across Europe and into classical lands. The American folklorist Linda Watts says this about the origins of the Yule log. The familiar custom of burning the Yule log dates back to earlier solstice celebrations and the tradition of bonfires. The Christmas practice calls for burning a portion of the log each evening until the 12th night, January 6th. The log is subsequently placed beneath the bed for luck and particularly for protection from the household threats of lightning and, with some irony, fire. <laughs> many have Many have beliefs based on the Yule log as it burns, and by counting the sparks and such, they seek to discern their fortunes for the new year and beyond. So there's an element of superstition that uh, came under Christian criticism later. The Romans apparently borrowed this custom of the Yule log during their Saturnalia festival. They would burn a Yule log to pay homage to the sun god. So again, it represented rebirth or renewal in some fashion. Now, I came across some evidence that the original Yule log was a phallic symbol. It isn't a big stretch to assume that any festival celebrating the rebirth of the sun or of life renewed would include phallic symbols. The mistletoe tradition holds that a man or woman is allowed to kiss any person standing beneath a sprig or bouquet of mistletoe. And bad luck, I don't know if you know about this, but bad luck falls on the person under the mistletoe if they refuse the kiss. The origins of the mistletoe is found in Britannia, used by Druid priests who also used evergreen plants in concert with mistletoe for their pagan ceremonies, with the mistletoe being the symbol for the birth of one of their gods. The Romans also utilized mistletoe during their Saturnalia festival but sometimes it went to extremes. You see, some men felt they were entitled to sexually molest any woman who passed under a sprig of mistletoe. Now, when you combine drinking, loosened moral restraints, the lack of law and order for about a week, and a lot of sexual symbolism, you have a recipe for riotous behavior. So the earliest forms of the newly christened Christmas was celebrated by excessive drinking, sexual indulgence, and singing naked in the streets. But when the church appropriated the holiday, they soon discovered they were unable to tame its raucous nature. The newly converted pagans basically said, we'll behave like good Christians 11 and a half months out of the year, but for the 12 days of Christmas, we're gonna let a little steam out. So it should come to, as no surprise that the first protesters against celebrating Christmas were not atheists infused with a strong political correctness streak, but Christians themselves, and the Puritans in particular. When they came to power in England and in New England, in America, in the 17th century, they outlawed Christmas for a few decades. Why would they do that? Because even though the holiday had been taken over by the church, it hadn't entirely lost, how shall I put this, it's free-spirited aspects. <laughs> now, why do we need religious festivals as part of the cultural offering in our community? Because I'm going to advocate that Christmas is essential for us to celebrate or some 
holiday during this month is essential for us to celebrate? Well, here's one reason. Because there is, at least in Western countries, can't speak for Asia, I don't know about it, but there is a profound loss of meaning. And the amount of drug use and depression in Western countries is ample evidence for it. So let's allow opportunities during the Christmas or Hanukkah or Ramadan or other religious seasons for people to find a way that provides meaning for their lives, even if it's a bit raucous. Loss of meaning in the West is growing and has led to this kind of art. And it's led to this kind of dehumanizing architecture. This style is called brutalism. Brutalism, as in brute. The concrete in this building is meant to make humans feel like nothing, to spiritually squash us. Now, this modern sense of nihilism and meaningless partially began with the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. There was indeed widespread corruption in the Catholic Church of France and reforms were needed, but the revolutionaries decided on violent retribution as the natural fruit of their worship of reason. Many priests, many good honorable priests and nuns were murdered in the name of reason. The final death blow for religion in Europe, at least, I think partially falls at the feet of this man, Friedrich Nietzsche. He did not promote nihilism, but his philosophy led to it. He realized that the death of the Western religious paradigm, the Judeo-Christian tradition, would bring about nihilism, but he contributed greatly to the loss of faith in the Judeo-Christian tradition as well. Credit for the fall of the Judeo-Christian narrative, I should say, falls at his feet for his attacks on Christianity. I believe he feared as much the loss of tradition as the narrative that informed these traditions. And that brings me to Christmas, which is derived, as I said before, from Christ's mass in the Catholic Church. We need rituals such as Christmas or Hanukkah or Ramadan or any other holiday, particularly at this time in winter when many of us get the winter blues. We need rituals because they provide order to our lives. Due to a crisis of meaninglessness and nihilism, big pharma and the therapeutic and psychiatric fields are having a field day from an income point of view. But based on the rising levels of depression and substance abuse, these industries aren't doing a very good job. No matter where you are in your own spiritual journey, it's undeniable that in the past, people did find life-sustaining, enhancing meaning in their various religious traditions. So much of the root of the West's failure to find meaning that would give us a sense of well-being is in the willful destruction of the narratives that gave us meaning in the past. Now, I'm not here to proselytize, but I do want to point out that the Western world does need its rituals and the narratives, the narratives included, associated with them, regardless if they're Christian or Buddhist or Jewish or whatever narrative you ascribe to. So first, let me say that we need the holiday seasons and we need practitioners of meaning to not feel they have to apologize for their religious or philosophical observances. Over the years, many of my Jewish friends have invited me to their Jewish holiday observances. I have never taken offense that they express their own beliefs with integrity in the observance of their religious rituals. In fact, I was honored that my Jewish friends would include me in such observances. It shows that they genuinely care for me. Likewise, my Buddhist friends over the years have invited me to their religious festivals and Muslims have invited me to their religious festivals. I did not take any offense, but felt honored. And when my atheist friends invite me to their homes in December where we celebrate absolutely nothing but our friendship, I do not take offense, but feel honored for the invitation. And for my pagan friends. Well, I already celebrate your holiday, with some exceptions, on December 25th. However, 
in case my mother is listening to this, if you do invite me to participate in your pagan festivals, I might let the drunkenness and orgies, uh, I might leave that aside. But can we please just relax about uh, sensitivity in celebrating Christmas or any of the holidays? I don't think we need to be generic at this time. I think we need to be specific. So whatever your tradition is, I invite you to embrace not only the rituals, but the narratives associated with it and embrace them gladly during this time. Trying to create a generic holiday season by restricting the use of any specific religious terminology for fear of offending somebody, it's, it's kind of insulting to our intelligence and our emotional and psychological maturity. So I'm unapologetic in offering a series this December titled The Art of Christmas. Just so you know, I have a sense of inclusivity. I will discuss at the next Art Brunch the Jewish influences on the holiday and why I believe we must retain them. And I'll also present the Christmas story from the Quran. You may not be aware, but the Quran does have a nativity story as well. Well, anyway, I'm glad that you were here this morning. I hope that you will um, look at your uh, celebration of this holiday, maybe in a new light, and um, might have some greater insight about the celebrations that you hold dear. At this time, I'm going to open it up to any of your comments or questions.